All right, so what we saw first is that Mendel made a bunch of observations. Second thing he did was he explained those observations. That was phase two that we've been talking about. Phase three we just finished, which is uh, demonstrating that his explanation actually matches the, uh, the observations. Okay, good. Now the question is this. Just because he's come up with an explanation, he can't just say that he's right. And there's no reason to believe that he's right, simply because he's come up with this explanation that fits the data. What he's got to do now is test it. And this is what we were getting at early on when we saw, for example, this, the uh, statement by uh, Richard Feynman. doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. Experimental tests are at the heart of all of science. Coming up with an explanation is only the beginning of it. What you have to do is follow through and test it. But what does it mean now? What does it mean to test the hypothesis here? I mean, haven't we already tested it? We have a bunch of data. He just demonstrated that his uh, hypothesis explains the data. Isn't that sufficient? And the answer is no, because of this. If you gather a bunch of data and then come up with an explanation for why the patterns in that data exist the way they are, you could be wrong. And if you use the data to support the patterns that you're explaining, then all you're doing is simply rounding around in a tautology. You're simply saying, well, how do I know I'm right? Well, my explanation fits the data. Where did you get the explanation from? I got it from the data. If your explanation doesn't fit the data, all that means is you're just a lousy hypothesis generator. So what he's got to do now is this. He has to do something completely new. He has to predict the outcome of an experiment that he himself has not performed yet after he's made the hypothesis. Now the hypothesis, remember, is this principle that we today call segregation, right? And that is particulate inheritance. There's two particles per trait, one from each parent, and one dominates. That's his explanation, remember, of those just seven traits. Okay, so now he's got to say, okay, well, what if I do a new experiment? Can I predict what I would get in that experiment if that hypothesis were correct? That's what he's got to do. Now, you should be able to explain why he can't just use the data that he uh, used to generate the hypothesis to test the hypothesis, why, like we just talked about. So be prepared for that kind of a question. All right. So what he's going to do then is this. He's going to do a number of different crosses, one of which I'm going to focus on, which we today call a test cross. It's called a test cross in part because it's really testing whether or not an individual is heterozygous. That's why it's called a test cross. Um, but in this case, we can think of it as a test cross because he's testing his hypothesis. Now what he's going to do now is this. He's going to do a cross between the F1. Now remember, that's the, the individual that came from the two parents that were breeding. And he's going to back cross it with his recessive parent. All right, let's go back up to here and see how that works. What we're saying is this. We're, here's the recessive parent. And here, then, is the F1. So the F1 is big R, little r. And we're going to back cross it here with little r, little r. Okay, now, do we expect to get a 3, point, uh, three to 1 ratio or something close to a 3 to 1 ratio? And the answer is no, we don't, because this is a different breeding. The breeding that gave us a 3 to 1 were these two crossed with each other, big R, little r cross big R, little r. That was this. But we're saying this now. We're saying big R, little r cross little r, little r. So that's not what we're going to predict. We're not going to, we're going to predict something other than three, a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. So the question that we always have to deal with when we deal with any of these genetics problems, and believe me, you're going to get lots and lots of genetics problems in this class. Do you know the genotypes of these parents? That's always the first question. Okay, well, do we know the genotype of the F1? The answer is yeah, we just saw it. It's big R, little r. Do we know the genotype of the recessive parent? Yes, it's little r, little r. All right, so if that's true, now we can set up the Punnett square. We can set this object up. It's pretty straightforward. What we do is say, okay, well, the F1 we know is big R, little r, so we have to draw its gametes out. So here, here's big R, little r. Those are the types of gametes that we can get from that uh, individual, from that F1 individual. Now remember, this is representing gametes, not just letters or not just, just alleles. This is representing an egg or a sperm cell. This is the female, this is the egg, and these are the two types of eggs that she can produce. If this is the male parent then, the recessive parent then is little r, little r, like we saw before. So therefore, we can only give little r and another little r. All right, so now, once we have this down, the rest is just basically mechanics. All we got to do is say, okay, well, this is an egg cell fertilized by this sperm. 
So the offspring is going to be big R, little r. But notice this one has to be exactly the same as, as this. The one on the, right on, the, on the right top has to be the same as the left top because they're identical situations. And what that tells us is this. Whenever we, we run into a situation like this in our Punnett square where we have doubled or more than one, we can cross it out because it's going to be exactly the same no matter what. So now this down here in the lower left box represents an egg, an egg carrying a little r being fertilized by a sperm from this parent, which is always little r, in which case then it's little r, little r, and it's got to be wrinkled. And again, we saw this column has to be equal to this column because both of these are little r. So we can totally ignore this one, and we get, this, we get the right answer. We expect then half of the offspring to be round because they're heterozygous, and half of the offspring from this cross should be wrinkled because they're homozygous recessive. All right, so that's our prediction. That's Mendel's prediction. He then performs the test. When he performs the test, he gets this. 106 came out round and 102 came out wrinkled. So here's the question that we ask. Did he prove anything? And the answer is no. We don't prove in science. We're not, that's not our goal. We're not here to dictate to everybody how things absolutely must be. What we're asking always in science is simply this. Do the data fit a hypothesis or not? That's the only question we really can, can deal with. You form opinions and ideas and, and make recommendations based on that, on that relationship between data and uh, conclusions and statements, hypotheses. But those are personal. Throughout your life, you are always allowed to believe whatever you wish. Our question in science is not to dictate who believes what. In science, our goal is simply to say, do these data support a hypothesis or do they not? Okay, so here's the data. 106, 102. Does that support Mendel's hypothesis, contradict Mendel's hypothesis, or say nothing about Mendel's hypothesis? One of the things that a lot of students do at your stage of development is to say, oh, we can't say anything. This doesn't, this doesn't say anything about Mendel's hypothesis because we need more data. We need more ex experiments. We need more, more, more. I don't disagree with the second part of that. Yes, we do need more data. I will say that because this one data set is not wildly convincing. But it's not the proper conclusion to say, oh, we don't know anything and it doesn't say anything about the hypothesis. That's incorrect. Look at these numbers. We're predicting half and half. Out of over 200 offspring, nearly half were round and nearly half were wrinkled. We don't expect exactly half and half because of randomness. Why? Where's the randomness here? Well, there's only randomness associated with these gametes, not these. The gametes coming from the wrinkled parent are always little r. It's the gametes coming from the heterozygous F1 that the randomness comes in. We flip a coin here, 50% chance of getting a big R, 50% chance of getting a little R. So that's why we don't expect to get exactly the same numbers. But you can't just say, oh, we don't know anything because we need more data. Of course, we always need more data. That's always going to be the case. So that's a given answer. The question is not that. The question is, do these data support the hypothesis or contradict it? And again, it's quite clear that these data support it. Do they prove that Mendel was right? No, of course not. Do they show that Mendel was right? No, we can't even say that. All we can say is the data support that conclusion. The conclusion may be false, the hypothesis may be false, but these data support it. It's possible for data to support a false conclusion. That doesn't mean it's guaranteed that it's false. Okay, now let's get back, let's step back a little bit, think about how we're thinking here. We're thinking like scientists. And science is, if you want to talk about the scientific method, in my opinion, science is simply being relentlessly intelligent. You don't go overboard with the data that you have, and you don't throw the data that you have out. You think carefully about it. These data are exactly what we predict based on Mendel's hypothesis. Therefore, these data support Mendel's hypothesis. Now, we say Mendel's hypothesis is true. We're quite certain, actually, that Mendel's hypothesis is true. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not the data that made us certain. This is only the data that pointed, the first data we ever had that pointed in the right direction. But since then, we have literally performed this experiment with this trait and other traits in this organism and other organisms literally millions of times, and it comes out 
pointing in that direction. And we now have other evidence, other lines of evidence, not just patterns from breedings, but the actual me molecular mechanisms of what's happening. So we know what's going on. But the point is this. We don't know Mendel was right because of this data set. This data set simply supports his conclusion. All right. So our next step then is this. We're going to go to the second half of Mendel's paper. These last two lectures have only been one half of Mendel's paper. The second half, he asks a different question, which we'll get into then very shortly.